romantic literature. As we begin to talk about romantic literature, we need to be reminded of the four main concerns of this romantic period. And I want to show you specifically how romantic literature um, addresses each of these concerns. The expression of personal and subjective feelings and subjective and not objective truths. A love of the fantastic and the exotic a spiritual, mystical view of nature, and then a reaction to industrialization. Let's start with the first one. The ideal romantic poet would express personal and subjective feelings and not objective truths. And if we remember the differences between Dryden's ideal poet and Wordsworth's ideal poet, you can clearly see um, what the romantics um, are trying to get at and what they're trying to express. For Wordsworth, then, um, poetry is emotion recollected in tranquility. It's his emotion coming out as he is sitting and, and looking at typically something in nature. And then what happens is he sits there and recollects these emotions. Then those emotions come out and onto the page. And you will see right after this particular video a link to a very famous poem by Wordsworth called Daffodils. And there you can really get his expression of his personal subjectivity and his emotion as he watches this field of, of daffodils. And this is a picture of um, the frontispiece to one of Wordsworth's poems called Tintern Abbey. And again, in Tintern Abbey, what's happening is the poet shows up, looks at these ruins, and then has this spontaneous overflow of feelings. And then out comes the poem. And it's very deeply personal and emotional and, and subjective. Likewise, these romantics were very interested in what was fantastic and exotic and um, what was different. They were very interested in the Gothic and the um, sort of passion that was associated with the Gothic and the mystery there. They were very interested in the Orient and Eastern cultures. And they often wrote of personal dream worlds. We see this most markedly, I believe, in Coleridge's poem, Kubla Khan. Now, Coleridge wrote Kubla Khan in the middle of an opium-induced dream. Coleridge had an opium problem, and so he was on an opium trip when he began Kubla Khan. And he woke up in this dream, and this is what came out. Well, interestingly, he was disturbed by a knock at the door, which jarred him out of the dream. And when he went back to finish the poem, he just couldn't quite do it. And you will be able to, again, hear Kubla Khan read after, on a link after this. And you will see um, how sort of exotic and fantastic um, the poem is. And it, it is sort of the quintessence of this romantic love for the fantastic. Another aspect of this love for the exotic as well comes from another romantic poet called Lord Byron. And his hero, which now carries the label, the Byronic hero, um, which first appears in one of Byron's, Byron's poems, Child Harold's Pilgrimage. The Byronic hero is always mysterious, gloomy, and brooding. He has superpowers and passions, but yet he's always guilt-ridden. And guilt drives him to very destructive behavior. He sees himself as above the law and is very misunderstood. But he's very compelling and fascinating to others. And interestingly, the Byronic hero has become um, a character in much literature, even film, up to this day, you can see the hero presented with these characteristics. Um, some that immediately come to mind that you might be familiar with in popular culture today are James Bond. He sort of has this 
um, these Byronic qualities. Um, likewise, so does Jack Bauer in 24, the television series, if any of you watched that. And I'm sure you can probably think of other films um, that reflect this type of Byronic hero. Third, um, we also see in the Romantic literature a spiritual, mystical view of nature. They saw nature as a spiritual inspiration, like I mentioned with Wordsworth and Daffodils and Wordsworth and Tintern Abbey. They use nature as a touchstone, as a way to become inspired for their feelings to come out. And so um, they were very much lovers of nature and believed that, that nature would provide inspiration for them. For the Romantics, nature was possibility, wild, untamed, but yet all of nature was interconnected and people were responsible for nature. And so while we had this sort of view of nature in the 18th century, that nature was something that needed to be tamed, that nature was something that needed to be brought under the control of humans um, to order it and sculpt it and mark its boundaries sort of in the neoclassical sense of, um, of balance and, and order and, and proportion. And then you see the romantic views of nature, and this is from a romantic, a John, a romantic painting by a, a man named John Constable, that nature is needs to be wild and untamed and unfettered in order for it to connect with the creative imagination. And that nature and human beings are connected to one another. And you really see that in this painting. And you'll also see it in um, the literature as these poets write about how um, nature is important to them. And nature functions as this this great almost spiritual entity for them. So we get this back to nature in romantic poetry, a focus on the individual and nature itself. And we see a lot of the these themes of nature as spiritual touchstone, focusing on the individual in a group of works called the Lyrical Ballads. The lyrical ballads were written by Wordsworth and Coleridge, and the first edition came out in 1798, the second edition in 1800. And in that second edition preface, Wordsworth wrote that what they were seeking to do was to depict incidents and situations from common life. In other words, to, words, to celebrate the common lives of ordinary people. And more importantly, in a selection of language really used by men. So they wanted to connect with people and they wanted to show the importance of just basic life in the world. And so they decided to present ordinary things in an unusual aspect to show how great and marvelous the individual could be even performing and even in the midst of very ordinary tasks. And this is where we get the famous quotes by Wordsworth that poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings recollected in tranquility. That comes from the lyrical ballads. And finally, as you see this celebration of nature, this celebration of the individual in Romantic poetry, it's pretty clear how the Romantic poets in England are, react are reacting to the industrialization that they see around them. As people were driven to the cities because of industrialization, um, the Romantic poets saw this as creating a sense of alienation that the people felt disconnected to each other and disconnected to nature at large. And so the Romantic poets believed that it was their job to reconnect individuals back to nature and back to each other through their poetry. Novelists also saw um, much of their work reacting to industrialization. 
and they wanted to actually contribute to social change. So these are just a few of the novelists writing in this Romantic period and, and later on into the 19th century that really seek to point out things in society that need to be changed in order to free the individual from the confines of social pressures and social norms and social mores. So even with the novelist, you see a true celebration of individuals as well. Now the Romantic era in America had many, many of these same ideals that um, the Romantic period in Europe did. And the Romantic era, era rather, in America was led largely by the Transcendentalists. And the Transcendentalists believed in the unity of humans with nature. Um, they developed notions of an order of truth that transcended what they could perceive by their physical senses and that united the entire world. Some of the most important transcendentalists were Emerson and Thoreau. And the transcendentalist movement was typically made up of very well-educated people who lived in the decades before the American Civil War. And what they sought was to create a uniquely American body of literature that showed this unity of humans with nature, that showed that there was a truth that transcended what we could perceive in our physical senses. The Enlightenment had come to new rational conclusions about the natural world, mostly based on experimentation and logical thinking. But the pendulum was swinging in a more romantic way of thinking, less rational, more intuitive, more in touch with the senses, was coming into vogue. So transcendentalism saw, viewed nature in this same romantic way. Um, also, um, the ideas of the East, Eastern religions such as Buddhism, were very important and very much influenced the transcendentalist as they celebrated the individual and as they celebrated the connection of humans with nature. Walt Whitman um, is a famous um, student of transcendentalism of Emerson and, Thoreau, and Thoreau and Whitman wrote extensively celebrating the importance of the individual and freedom and also showing how humanity united with the universe again all very romantic concepts and Whitman is considered to be America's first great poet and here's a picture of Whitman and his moniker, the poet of democracy. So you can see uh, just in that particular phrase what Whitman was all about. He worked in a newspaper print shop at 11, taught school for a while, wrote for the Democratic Review, um, so spent some time in journalism. He also worked as a nurse during the Civil War, worked at the Department of Interior. He's had a very interesting life, but his poetry revolutionized the American genre. He rejected established poetic forms. He embraced free verse, which is just conversational. Like Wordsworth said, they wanted to write in the language of ordinary people, not in the heroic couplets of the, of the um, Augustans of the 18th century. Um, and again, celebrated the mystical divine potential of individuals. One of his most famous poems is Song of Myself, and there, just in the title, you can see what was important to him. And again, after this um, video is over, you'll be able to go hear um, some of that poem read and see what it's all about. In that poem, he celebrates identity and individuality. In 1855, it was first published with no title, and then he, in 1856, he called it Poem of Walt Whitman, an American. Um, 1860, just Walt Whitman. And finally, in 1881, it came to be called Song of Myself. So after this presentation is over, 
um, please, please go listen to the three romantic poems that I have for you. Daffodils by Wordsworth, Kubla Khan by um, Coleridge, and Song of Myself by Whitman. And I think they will give you a much better sense of what romantic poetry was all about.